Good evening and welcome to our study of the book of Isaiah. Tonight we're going to be looking at chapters 28 through 30. Just a reminder, when we make our way to the book of Isaiah, Assyria is in charge. They are the dominant world power. We tend to think of the Medes and the Persians, certainly Babylon as a great world power. But at this time, Assyria is actually the most dominant nation in the world. And their capital city at the time is Samaria. Now, because we are New Testament Christians, we love uh, the New Testament, the story of Jesus's life in the Gospels, and then uh, the book of Acts, the letters uh, written by the apostles. We think of Samaritans and the way that they would have been viewed during that time. We think of the good Samaritan or the woman at the well and some of those interactions. But Samaria at this time is really just a capital city of a nation, and it's not really its own people group the way we would think about them. So um, just an important reminder. Another important reminder as we make our way through the book of Isaiah, uh, something that we just have to keep in the forefront of our minds, it is a divided kingdom. There is north and south. There is Israel and there is Judah. They're all Jews, but they are divided at the time. And when we think of Israel, sometimes we speak of the entire nation, but we're actually talking about the northern tribes of Israel. And then when we talk about Judah, we're talking about the southern tribes. So that division is important for us to understand. Isaiah is speaking primarily to Judah and the tribes of Judah not the northern tribes of Israel. That's a little bit confusing because so much of the book of Isaiah addresses Israel, but that is given as a warning to Judah. Look at what's going on in Israel. Look at what they've done. Look at the choices that they've made. Look at the wrath of God that's coming against them. And so it's warnings given to Judah often about Israel. So those two things, important to hold on to as we dive into our study of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 28, we're going to read the first nine verses to get things started. Woe to that wreath, the pride of Ephraim's drunkards, to the fading flower, his glorious beauty, set on the head of a fertile valley, to that city, the pride of those laid low by wine. See, the Lord has one who is powerful and strong, like a hailstorm and a destructive wind. Like a driving rain and a flooding downpour, he will throw it forcefully to the ground. That wreath, the pride of Ephraim's drunkards, will be trampled underfoot. That fading flower, his glorious beauty, set on the head of a fertile valley, will be like figs ripe before harvest. As soon as people see them and take them in hand, they swallow them. In that day, the Lord Almighty will be a glorious crown, a beautiful wreath for the remnant of his people. He will be a spirit of justice to the one who sits in judgment, a source of strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. And these also stagger from wine and reel from beer. Priests and prophets stagger from beer and are befuddled with wine. They reel from beer. They stagger when seeing visions. They stumble when rendering decisions. All the tables are covered with vomit, and there is not a spot without filth. Who is it he is trying to teach? To whom is he explaining his message? To children weaned from their milk? To those just taken from the breast? Now, this is a tough section of scripture if you don't understand the context. What's going on, really, is that the nation of Israel, they've already been beaten down in a real way by Assyria. And yet, they're able to maintain their government. They're able to maintain having a king. And they're paying tribute, kind of like paying taxes, but they're under kind of the rule or reign of Assyria, and they decide that's not the place where they belong. We're the children of God. We should be able to uh, rule ourselves without paying tribute to anyone, and God should protect us because we are his children. We're his chosen people. And so they stand with pride in being the children of God, and yet they're not living for God. They're not turning their hearts toward God. They're not seeking his wisdom or his guidance. They're getting drunk. Even the priests, even the um, Levites, the people that are serving in the temple, they are so caught up in just ugly um, debauchery lifestyles that are ungodly that they do not look like the people of God, but they're saying, yeah, we kind of live however we want, but God should protect us. God should watch over us. 
And the punishment that comes is that Israel is going to be crushed. They're going to be crushed by Assyria. They're going to be beat down because of um, their lack of obedience to God and faithfulness and trust in the Lord. But Isaiah says a remnant will remain. There will be a place where the righteous are watched over and taken care of, and, and God will still keep his promises and help this nation. It's a beautiful thing to think about this reality that God is watching over the nation of Israel, and he is delivering love and grace and mercy, while at the same time, justice that's such a hard balance. And again and again in the book of Isaiah, we see that God is a loving God and a God who is righteous and holy. And that's exactly what we want. Um, we just do not want a world where people can harm children, take advantage of people, treat people poorly, and everybody just acts like that's okay. Um, where the strong survive and they can beat on anybody that they want. We don't want to live in a world like that. We don't think that that's okay. And so we want justice and we long for that, especially when someone's unjust toward us. But we also recognize that we've been unjust and unkind and don't always treat people in a way that it's right. We don't always do what God calls us to do. And so we recognize the need for God to be gracious and kind and loving. And so if we really stop to think about the, the kind of God that we would long for, if we were to make him up, we would certainly say we want a God that is loving and kind and is also just and lives in that perfect balance. Well, the true God, the God of the scriptures, the God that we long to be with, he is that. He is the perfect balance of love and justice, of what is right and good and true and um, a God that is forgiving and, and gracious to us. So what a wonderful thing that um, God is exactly what we, we desperately need him to be if we stop and think about um, who God is and, and what just is right as far as judgment is concerned. And so God, this perfect mixture of, of love and grace and justice. But the people, they're caught up in drunkenness. And that's including the priests. People are even doing the things that they're supposed to be doing to bring glory and honor to God. They're doing it while they're drunk. What a ugly thing. What a terrible thing um, that they would be overcome with wine so much so that they couldn't serve God in the temple. I like the King James Version of verse 7 um, where the NIV talks about being befuddled with wine. The King James says they were swallowed up by it. And so instead of them drinking the wine, the wine is swallowing them. That, to me, is a picture of addiction. Addiction, at least in my understanding, is when you are not controlling something, but it's controlling you. So uh, maybe you drink alcohol or um, uh, your addiction might be overeating. It might be spending. It might be, um, you know, that you are, are so attached to your phone that it's distracting you from other things. We can be addicted to a lot of things. And I think all of us battle something in our life that we don't control. It kind of controls us. Um, if you don't think that's true of you, yours is probably pride or arrogance, right? We all have something that is a battle for us sin-wise, and it, it controls us more than we control it. And when that happens, when we lose control, when we cross that line, it just gets worse and worse and worse, and it becomes difficult for us to battle. Now, the people that I um, just look to as great inspirations, um, several of them have battled addiction in their lifetime whether it's pornography, alcohol, drugs, whatever the addiction might be, they have fought it, they have overcome it, and they're on the other side celebrating recovery and doing some wonderful things. But um, addiction in our world has become something that people um, often wear as a license to fall back into the sin that they've um, been trapped in. And they say, well, I'm an addict, I just do this, or I, I'm battling addiction, so I just do that. And there's not the same level of repentance that I see in others. And victory over addictions, I think, is hard work and requires a lot of dedication and a lot of passion and also that feeling of remorse. 
the way I was going, that's not the way I want to go. So I'm going to turn. I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to try to do right things. And so it's not just about stopping the bad behaviors, but starting positive behaviors. And that takes a lot of work. And you can't just wear it as a badge. Oh, that's my issue. So I can fall into it and fall out. No, it's not a big deal. That's just what I, I deal with. But actually, it should be something that we're repentant of and fighting. But addiction is hard. It's a challenge. And I really believe that um, some people have addictive personalities. It's more difficult for them in some ways in regards to substance abuse, things like that. But all of us have things that tend to control us and we don't control those things very well, whether it's our tongue, whether it's our appetite. Um, they're just different things that we have to battle to be holy. See, the reason it's so easy to fall into addiction or hypocrisy, we're going to see that in the chapters ahead, is because we are naturally selfish. We're self-serving our own desires, our own wants. And doing right and being holy and doing good things, that requires effort. That requires a great deal of, of sacrifice and effort, volition that we are given by God. Certainly, it's a work of a, the Spirit to help us, um, but we also have our own choice in this life and we have to choose right things. And so um, this imagery here of uh, the drunkenness and these lifestyles, it, it's very um, contrary to the will of God. And God says, yeah, you might think that, okay, you're standing and saying, I'm a child of God now. I don't pay tribute. I don't worship these other gods. But look at what you're surrendering your life to. Look at what controls you. Is it the word of God and the will of God? Or is it your own selfishness and desire? So they're caught up in that. And we pick up then in verse 10. For it is, do this, do that. A rule for this, a rule for that. A little here, a little there. Very well then, with foreign lips and strange tongues, God will speak to this people, to whom he said, this is the resting place, let the weary rest, and this is the place of repose. But they would not listen. So then, the word of the Lord to them will become, do this, do that, a rule for this, a rule for that, a little here, a little there, so that as they go, they will fall backward. They will be injured and snared and captured. So these are people mocking the word of God. God says, do this, do that, do this, do that. We're not going to do it. We don't have to do those things. Even though we're children of God, we do not have to be obedient. And so they're mocking of the things of God. And God says, um, I wanted to give you rest. I wanted to give you peace. I wanted to give you these wonderful things. But you refuse to listen to the word of God. And the result is they are struggling. And we pick up verse 14. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, we have an agreement. When the overwhelming whip passes through, it will not come to us. For we have made lies our refuge, and in falsehood we have taken shelter. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste, and I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line, and hail will sweep away the refuge of lies, and waters will overwhelm the shelter. Then your covenant with death will be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overwhelming surge passes through, you will be beaten down by it. God says, to them that they cannot mock him. They cannot just say, I'm not going to do what God has called me to do. I'm going to trust in these other nations. I'll enter into these other covenants um, and then I'll be okay. I'll find rest and peace and sanctuary in these other nations that are actually ruling over us. And God says, that's foolishness. You've made a covenant with death. You've made a covenant with the grave and you're not going to be kept in that covenant. You're going to die. You're going to suffer because of what you've done. Um, these relationships that you've formed and these alliances that you've formed, they're really going to be toxic and end up leading to negative things. And of course, we see that for Israel and ultimately Judah as well. But the covenant that they make is not a covenant that's going to save them from death. Then God makes this bold um, statement about the cornerstone, the foundation that they need to be resting on, and it is his covenant, the covenant that God makes with his people. 
uh, we know that the chief cornerstone is Jesus. And we see that clearly in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. So Peter is reminding us that the chief cornerstone, it's Jesus. That Jesus is the one that we can trust in. He's the foundation of our life. He's the one that establishes the covenant that's not going to fall apart. And in Christ, um, like Isaiah said, death will be annulled. It will be taken care of, but not because we are trusting in other nations or trusting in ourselves, but because Jesus is a firm foundation, a cornerstone, and a capstone that we can align ourselves with when we trust in him. I, I love it that Isaiah talks about trusting in Jesus and putting our faith in him um, because he is the cornerstone, a solid foundation. For the nation of Israel, that would not have been their understanding of this passage of Scripture. They are looking at this and they're thinking, okay, the solid foundation, it is Jerusalem. It is God and his word and his will. That's what we need to trust in, but not align ourselves with these foreign gods. But the people, they are in agreement with um, going into an alliance with another nation to save them, to rescue them. And so that's the, the road that they're going down. And Isaiah says God is still going to save some. There's going to be a remnant. There are going to be those whose sins are forgiven. And so again, we see God's grace and mercy for the nation of Israel. But God does then go on to say that you will face consequences and you are going to be crushed by your enemies. Now, when we see that, God then starts to tell a parable that ends chapter 28. And I think it's pretty neat. It's a parable about farmers. And he says farmers don't just plow and plow and plow and just plow forever. They plow, they work the field, they break things up, but then they also plant, they also harvest. You know, farming isn't just one thing. Well, God is doing a lot more than one thing. And this is a moment in time. This is part of what God is doing, bringing judgment against the nation of Israel, bringing punishment against them. But he has planned something more. Look at Isaiah chapter 28, verse 29. All this also comes from the Lord Almighty, whose plan is wonderful, whose wisdom is magnificent. This is a great teaching that you've probably heard a million times, right? Every church group, every denomination that I've ever been a part of, been around, there is conversation about God's will, God's purpose, God's plan. God has a plan for his people. God has a plan for eternity and a plan for salvation. Well, people differ about how much God is working in those plans, um, differing ideas of how much um, volition and control we have. But everyone who believes and trusts in God believes that he does have a plan, and that we need to trust in that. That's hard when we're in the middle of hardship and trial and struggle, but Isaiah is reminding the people God's plan is good. His wisdom, it's great. It's magnificent. We've got to trust in God. Now we flip over to chapter 29, and we're not going to look at much of chapter 29 tonight, but I want to look at verse 1 and verse 13. Woe to you, Ariel, the city where David settled. Add year to year and let your cycle of festivals go on. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. So Isaiah says in Jerusalem, they're continuing on with their festivals. They're doing things that bring glory and honor to God, but they're not doing them in the right manner. He says, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are very far from me. And so this is a reminder that we can do right things and not be honoring to God. That we can make the right choices, but do them for the wrong reasons. Martin Luther once said something to the effect of, my prayers need to be prayed over and my tears need to be wept over. And I think that is just a beautiful sentiment of a heart that wants to honor God and serve God, but recognizes that we're not really capable of doing that perfectly on our own. All of us have mixed motives in what we do and a measure of selfishness even to our right choices. 
we might do the right thing to make us feel good about ourselves. We might do the right thing because that means other people will like us or um, they will think well of us. And so even the good things we do oftentimes come from, at least in, in some measure, a place of pride and arrogance inside of us. And so that mixture of emotions is always there. And we have to fight for humility and we have to fight to do things that bring glory and honor to God. One thing you'll hear a lot in the church is that everything people do is worship. And I've heard people say, you know, our whole lives, they're meant to be worship, but our whole lives are worship to God, not just Sunday morning or not just our, our times of devotion and prayer. And I love the sentiment of that, but it's just not a true reality that I understand because worship is intentional. And yes, everything we do and say should be done in the name of the Lord and for the glory of God. But can we honestly say that we're intentional in everything that we do? And we do that to bring glory to God and not just for selfish reasons? Of course not. So we have to battle to be holy. We have to fight our way into moments of worship and give God our very best, our attention, our affection, our heart. And that is not only a, a work of volition, but it's also a work of the Spirit where God changes things inside of us. And so it is a connection um, physically, mentally, emotionally, but also of our choice. It is an act of will. And I think that's really important to understand. The nation of Israel, they're doing some right things, but they're not doing that to bring glory and honor to God. And that's how you become pharisaical. That's how you become a hypocrite. And that is, like I said earlier, that's kind of our default position. We fall to selfishness. That's something that's easy for us. It's natural for us. We have to fight it. Now, this chapter ends with a picture of the Spirit moving and coming upon the nation of Israel in power. God changing things in the future. And it's a beautiful thing. I would encourage you to read that. We're going to see that again in the next few chapters in um, uh, just neat ways. And so we're going to move past that for now. Um, but don't miss that in your personal study because it is um, just a, a good picture of grace and mercy and the movement of the Spirit, which is always good and encouraging for us. But now we're going to move over to chapter 30. And we're going to pick up in verse 1. Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin, who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. But Pharaoh's protection will be your shame. Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. Though they have officials in Zoan and their envoys have arrived in Haines, Everyone will be put to shame because of a people useless to them who bring neither help nor advantage, but shame and disgrace. This is insane. The nation of Israel, God's people who he rescued from Egypt. Now they're going back to Egypt for help. Every one of these people, they grew up knowing the story of God rescuing them from Pharaoh and how quickly Pharaoh turned his heart away from Joseph. And yet now they're saying, that's a safe place for us to go for help. Nothing can go wrong here. Well, it's foolishness and that arrogance is going to lead them to a lot of trouble. They were having trouble and they looked into the world for peace. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. And that, I think, is such a key for us in understanding what our lives are meant to be about and where we find peace and rest. We find it in Jesus Christ not in the world. And if you look to the world for peace, you're going to find yourself experiencing heartache and struggle and anxiety and fear. Why? Because worldly things can be stripped away and you lose control, you lose power when you give over your heart and affection to the world. It can all be stripped away. But Jesus Christ, if we trust in him, he will never leave us or forsake us. And so we've got to find our peace. We've got to find our trust in the person of Jesus. We pick up then verse 12. Therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message, relied on oppression, and depended on deceit, this sin will become for you like a high wall, cracked and bulging, that collapses suddenly in an instant. It will break into pieces like pottery, shattered so mercilessly that among its pieces not a fragment will be found for taking coals from the hearth or scooping water out of a cistern. Israel's hurting at this point. 
the walls that are meant to protect them are going to fall down. Egypt is not going to be able to take care of them, and they are going to be crushed. They are going to face hardship and trial, difficult things. Why? Because they didn't trust in the message of God, because they didn't turn to the word of God. We need to be people that turn to God's word, and we need to trust in it. That's where we find our peace. That's where we find our strength, and that's where we find the type of salvation that God wants us to experience now and forever. Look at verse 15. This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation, in quietness and trust is your strength, but you would have none of it. So I love this picture of grace and um, experiencing salvation from God, rest, peace, quiet, trusting in the Lord and experiencing all these wonderful things. And it happens from repentance. And that's not just saying, I won't do it anymore, but actually turning your mind, your attention, your affection toward God and living for him. And it requires quietness and peace and rest. You know, there's a reason why Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness after he had been um, there for so long and struggling, hungry and tired. Because when we're hungry and tired, we don't function at the highest level. We need rest. We need quiet moments to reflect, to think things through. I think one of Satan's great victories in our world is that we feel like we always have to be entertained. Um, I've seen so many people get up, go to the restroom, and they're like, oh, I didn't have my phone. Grab it and then go. Why? They don't even want to be uh, alone for a second with their thoughts or anything else. It's um, just a, a crazy world that we live in. We want to be entertained. We want to be connected to other distractions. And being alone with our thoughts is a challenge for people. Why? Because that's when God wants to speak to us. And we need to be quiet sometimes. We need to be at peace. We need to think things through. We need to meditate on the Word of God. We need to think higher thoughts about who God is and why we're here. And there is salvation and repentance in quietness, reflection, and trusting in truth. And so I think the call here is for us to read the Word of God and then rest in it for a while. Not quickly run to a commentary, not quickly run to a lesson that somebody wrote about a passage of Scripture, but to quietly think about the Word of God and reflect on it for yourself because God will speak to you. And God will lead you to salvation. And it can't be that you don't want none of that. <laughs> you want to be a person that chases after the rest and the peace that comes from knowing God. And we don't search for that out in the world. And now, um, I just want us to end with Isaiah giving answer for what we are meant to do, how we're meant to respond to receiving that grace. Let's um, read verses 18 through 21. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. People of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. How gracious he will be when you cry for help. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes, you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. I love that. God says, I'm going to be gracious to you. I'm going to be kind to you. I'm going to rescue you. And you're going to hear my voice. Your teachers are going to speak. And they will say, this is the way, walk in it. God's voice telling you where to go, telling you how you're meant to live and act so that you can be who you've been created to be, who God desires for you to be. And that is the response to grace, obedience. If God does something wonderful for you, you're going to want to live for him. You know, if somebody gives me a gift, I want to give them something back. Um, and sometimes I've been overwhelmed with something that somebody's given me. And how do I repay them for that? How do I pay them back for such an act of kindness? And it's a difficult thing, but you feel that desire. That's worshiping God. God has been gracious to us, and we should want to respond in obedience and service and sacrifice for his glory. So I invite you to consider the grace of God that has come to you and how you can respond in faithfulness. Thank you so much for spending some time in the book of Isaiah with me. Um, next week, we're going to tackle uh, chapters 31, hopefully through 35. That's going to be our goal. Um, but thank you for spending some time in the Word with me tonight. Let's pray as we uh, finish our time together.
God, you're good. Thank you for our Bibles. Thank you for Jesus, the chief cornerstone. God, thank you for opportunities to repent and turn toward um, obedience. Forgive us of our sins, God, and help us to strive to show you every day how grateful we are that you are our God. Forgive us of our sins. Guide us to those things that are right and true that bring you glory, Lord, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. Just a reminder, we're transitioning over from our um, current online worship service that has been, uh, for the most part, pre-recorded and put together for Vimeo and then dispersed through our website and Facebook. And now we're transitioning over to YouTube. It's a blessing for us. It's a little bit easier, less work. And I think it's a, a real big blessing for the church because it's actually live stream. You'll see the sermon as it happens. You'll see hear the worship of the congregation, um, the things that you miss not being um, with your brothers and sisters at the church. We're just going to try to bring that into your house. And so hopefully that'll be a blessing to those of you who aren't able to make it in person. And so that's coming up. You'll see that on YouTube starting this Sunday. And I hope that'll be a blessing and encouragement to you. If you don't get to see it right on time, you can always return. The recorded versions will be there um, archived to watch later. Um, but the live stream is going to be Sunday mornings, our first service at 9 a.m. And so uh, just make sure that you're aware of that. Thanks again for studying with me. God bless. Have a great evening.